you turn to Luke chapter 15. <clears throat> Luke chapter 15. Beginning in verse 3, it says, And he, that's Jesus, spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. <clears throat> I uh, put uh, that quote that I read last week there for your reading pleasure about repentance. Uh, it's, uh, tonight we'll I want to talk about repentance. and different, I've talked about repentance recently. I want to talk about it again. And talk about it in, in, in addition to the concept of per, what they call the perseverance of the saints and um, several other things in between. But you might, uh, if you, I want to like to read that again to you from Top Lady, where he says, Repentance is one of those graces without which there can be no salvation. It's an essential prerequisite to spiritual peace on earth and absolutely necessary as a preparative for the eternal happiness of heaven. The reason is evident, specifically, because every man is a fallen being. We must, therefore, by the effectual working of God's good spirit, be made sensible of our fall, or we shall never feel our need of redemption and restoration from it through the alone covenant grace of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Not that either repentance or faith or any of their practical fruits are in the least respect causal or conditional or meritorious of pardon, happiness, and eternal life. Every grace and every good work are the free gift of God. From him only all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed. Consequently, we cannot possibly, in the very nature of things, merit or entitle ourselves to his favor by any grace we exercise or by any duty we perform. His gifts lay us under infinite obligations to him instead of empowering us to merit anything from him. They do not render him a debtor to us, but render us unspeakable and everlasting debtors to him. So just read that again. So point to, the first point uh, from the reading is that repent, repentance is commanded of God. Turn to Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, it says in verse 30, this is Peter preaching. Um, at the times of this ignorance God, ignorance, God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he's appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, that's Christ, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. So there's a, an appointed day of judgment, and he's, God commands all men everywhere uh, to, to repent or turn from their idea of they can save themselves, turn from their idea that they merit the favor of God, and turn instead to the work of Christ alone on the behalf of sinners, paying that sin debt. Um, so point number one is that repentance is commanded, and repentance is is the work of God alone. Now we'll get to the next part of God. Does God desire or request that which he alone provides? The short answer is yes. Uh, repentance is, is the work of God, and you can see it in the parable back in Luke 15, where he lays the uh, uh, lost sheep on his shoulders and carries it home. 
Um, uh, I, I have a, a, and this is something that separates Christianity, <laughs> true Christianity, from all the world's religions, whether it's uh, Buddhism or Islam or modern day Jewry or uh, Arminianism, and that is that those religions make man a helper uh, in his own salvation, if not the main cause of his salvation, whereas the gospel alone proclaims that salvation is by grace of God uh, solely and alone. It's, it's, it's uh, by grace you're saved. Uh, not, uh, it's a gift of God, not of works. So the, the thing that uh, struck me, and I was, I was, I got another verse here, and I want to do a little run up to it. That you know, in 500 years ago, in the Reformation, the re the Reformation upended the order of things because the the Word of God was now accessible to so many people. It's kind of like with the internet in a way. All of a sudden, people had books, and they, they, the printing press changed everything. And so you didn't have to have scribes writing things out and reading handwriting. So all of a sudden, a lot of people started looking at the word and asking questions. And that upended the order of things. Uh, at that time, it was wrong. You couldn't challenge doctrines of the church, particularly of the Catholic church, which, which ruled in that day. And you, even if those doctrines were ridiculous, for example, in that time period, about three million people were slaughtered because of things such as saying that that wine that we drink at the Lord's Supper is not in truth the blood of Christ. That lit it doesn't literally become blood, which is what the Catholics have been saying for so long. And that piece of bread that was there, that literally became his flesh. If you argued and said, no, it's really just bread, and that's really just wine, doesn't you didn't change it. That was enough to get you dead. And so challenging these doctrines was was a a big deal in the reformation and I, I say to you that today to challenge the world's doctrines about repentance and salvation it's the same it's the same transgression against their way of seeing things and i was thinking to myself as i was looking at these passages you know you could say if today you can't challenge for example or we we challenge but it's not polite to challenge the idea that God loves everybody. And all you have to do, you don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be a Gnostic. You don't have to be someone who's in love with learning to ask simple questions like, well, if God loves everybody, why isn't everybody saved? And if everybody isn't saved, what's the problem? And we know everybody's not saved. Scripture says everybody's not saved. Uh, you could talk about Demas, you could talk about uh, 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 Judas, you could talk about Pharaoh, you could talk about a lot of different people. We know everybody's not saved, so therefore, what's the problem? If you say, well, God's done everything he can, it's up to man now, you're saying that man rules over his own salvation, and that's what most people say. So just using your common sense. Or if man doesn't, and man's will is more important than God's. God wants it done, but it takes man to get the job done. Or you could say that God wants everybody saved, but he can't do it. He himself is not omnipotent. He doesn't do everything as he wills in heaven and earth, as the scripture says that he does. So I point that out because as we're, as we're looking at this, um, to turn to, uh, I, I've actually got it in your, in your thing here, Isaiah 40, turn to Isaiah 42, 16. The supposed Christians of our day can't even tolerate a question as simple as that. They're, they're, they are totally devoid of the knowledge of the, of the word. In Isaiah 42 and verse 16, it says, And I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. And uh, Richard Warmack posted last week a comment on that. I thought, and I put the comment in there for your reading pleasure. That notice how that you know this is all of God. This is all the salvation is is Christ centric. He says, "I will bring, I will lead, I will make darkness light." And today's modern religion is about self righteousness 
It's about their work. It's, you know, what, you know, won't you open your heart? Won't you make this decision? Won't you repent of your sins and turn unto him? No, that all of these works of salvation are works that, that God inspires, that God works out in his people to his own glory that no man can boast. And so when we see these things uh, where God uh, commands men to repent, we see a perfect picture of repentance and then God bringing his lost sheep home. And not that, uh, and this not being a choice or a decision or an action or like a baptism or anything of that nature that would merit salvation. And to think that that's so goes across the grain of the scripture in two ways. First, if man's choice and man's repentance or decisions, if that were what merited salvation, it would make man sovereign over God, as I'd mentioned before. And, and think about it even, it's not only would it make man sovereign over God, it's an expression of his hatred. Now think about it. If, and I, I, I saw this recently in my own family, and it's a, it's a very sad thing. But let's suppose that um, my children will only love me if I do the things that they approve of. You would say, well, that's that's horrible. They're trying to, if I do what they want, then they then they show me approval. You say, well, that's obviously works. That's not, that's not really love, but hatred in, in the sense that it restricts me, it limits me, it, it 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 controls me and tries to bend me to their will. And you say, well, that's that's just that's just not right. Well, how different is it if we say that the sinner says, if I do this, then God must do that. It. You would, you would say of my children, they don't love you at all, but they, they hate you. You know, they, if you go against them, they'll dis so disapprove of you, they'll cut you off. And so it is when we say that, well, if, if, we, if the sinner can say, if, if I do this, then God must save me. Or if, I, if, if, if that's not true, if God won't jump when I tell him to jump, then I won't have that God. And that's what they say. And that's nothing but hatred. It's, it's hatred. So then number one, this idea that man is going to repent and he's going to make the choice and he's going to save himself is an expression of hatred against God. It doesn't even make good sense or common sense. Uh, but, but rather, uh, a second is that it presumes that man's choice, his decision or his repentance will be acceptable before a perfect God, that he is, has, he's offering up a holy repentance, a perfect repentance that pleases God. And obviously uh, that's beyond man's capabilities. Um, so rather that um, I would uh, counsel any person to throw away their any hope that they might have in their own choice or action and rest solely on Christ's work on the behalf of sinners. And uh, and if you think about this in the, in the New Testament and you think about the thief on the cross, you know, what what decision did he make for Jesus? What baptism did he do? No, solely the revelation of God that he was worthy of what he was getting, but Christ had done nothing amiss. Christ was altogether perfect. Christ was the Lord from heaven, and he saw what that sacrifice was going to mean for sinners, and he put his hope there. Or you could say the same thing about Mary Magdalene as she wept at Jesus' feet. She was... Uh, I don't think she was comforted because she decided for Jesus or was getting baptized or any such thing. She was comforted uh, solely because of the work of God in her life. So, so point number two, repentance is the work of God. It's not the work of man to make this choice or decision or action that's going to turn him. It's God turning, as it says in the Old Testament, turn us and we shall be turned. And God does the God always does the turning. There's two different kinds of repentance in the in the Bible and the Greek. One is a repentance that basically says, "I'm really sorry about that. I wish I wasn't going to get busted for it. I wish I wasn't going to suffer punishment for it." And then there's another punishment that's a changing of the mind, like that a complete change of of thinking about things. I'm sure there are a lot of criminals in jail that repent, wish they hadn't got caught, wish they didn't have to suffer the punishment, even think that they were dumb about doing it. But it's a whole different thing to completely turn, change your mind, uh, and and uh, dis you know agree with what you disagreed with before, and uh, and find in Christ uh, all that the sinner needs, and not in uh, anything that they 
merit. Turn to um, Hebrews 11, and, and I ask the question, why does God command that which he alone supplies? If God is the, uh, uh, the first cause of repentance of man, if he says, I'll bring, I'll lead, I'll make, if he puts the sinner on his shoulders and carries him back, why does God speak as if he commands, I, I read two verses here. One verse was, God commands all men everywhere to repent. And on the other hand, we look at the picture of repentance and we see him lifting the lamb on his shoulders and carrying him home and saying, and saying this, is, this is repentance. Uh, if you, you might want to go back and look at that verse again. It's, it's certainly worth it because uh, in describing this, Jesus says, um, speaking of the story he just told about the lost sheep and the carrying them back home, he says, he says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repentance, repents. So he's saying, this is my description of repentance to you. This is God bringing home his lost sheep. And, um, and so does God command, which he does, he commands all men everywhere to repent. Does he command that which only he can supply? And the answer to that is yes. You know, in Hebrews 11, it says, in 11 verse 6, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. In 11 6. In Hebrews 12, he says, Jesus is the author and finisher of faith. Okay? If you want to turn to turn to 1 Peter 1 16. Now, this is a quote from the Old Testament, but. In 1 Peter in 1.16, he says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. There's the command. Go to Isaiah 54. So that's God's command to you. Be holy. He's holy. You be holy. In Isaiah 54, in verse... 17, it says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Be ye holy, that's the command, their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. So the, com the point is, is what, it's the same thing that Pastor Chuck brought up this morning. The command shows you your need. The command shows you your need. The need drives the sinner's plea. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 36. If God didn't command it, you wouldn't see your need. When God says, be holy, you look at yourself and you go, that's not me. Scripture says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. What faith do I have? This poor, pathetic thing, how much, you know, you know, where, where's, how strong is my faith? Do I want to bet my eternal soul on that? <clears throat> In Ezekiel 36 and verse 37, speaking of the work of God to save sinners, he says, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I will, be, I will increase them with men like a flock. So, so, so I said, the, the command, be holy, without faith it's impossible to please him, and so forth. For these things, sh showing you your bankruptcy, God shows you, shows you your need. The need drives you to plea, to make the plea. need drives you to inquire of God, of hope, for hope in Christ, that you would have some saving interest in Christ Jesus. Turn to um, Job chapter 33. Now, Elihu is speaking here.
Job 33, verse 27, he says, he, he, God, looks upon men, and if any say, I have sinned and perverted that which is, was right, and it profited me not, he will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. Lo, all these things worketh God oftentimes with man. So when man sees, when he, uh, he look, he, they see their situation truthfully. They see their faithlessness. They see their lack of holiness. They see the command of God and the requirement of God, perfection. Um, that, drives their, that drives their need. Then they look upon Christ and they see in there everything as I think, I don't know if it's Beethoven or Moses, the joy of a man's desire. They see, they see all that they need bottled up in him and that God himself coming down from heaven and, and paying for the sin of man with his own blood on the cross of Calvary. So point number four, the rejoicing of the saints testifies that the work of salvation is not uncertain or unsure. This is a very interesting point. It says, if this salvation was tentative on their continued obedience, I don't think the saints would be rejoicing. It says they are full of rejoicing. And the only way they could, if they were, if they thought, well, this, if this was just the first step, well, it looks like, uh, it, it, it looks like uh, that sinner is, has repented. Well, we'll see if he hangs on to the end. No, we're not so sure. We'll just kind of hang on until he finally gets here. No, they're rejoicing right now when God turns that heart away from self-reliance, away from all that his own nature desires and says, I, I see everything I need in Christ. He is my hope and my, and my he is right and I'm wrong. When the sinner sees this, this, this the saints, of the, the angels of heaven shout for joy. There's, there's very joy in heaven. I don't think they would be joyful if this were just conditioned on some further obedience. So in here we see what's called the doctrine of the preserva perseverance of the saints. They will make it. They're going to be there by the work that God just did in their life. Now they may not, they may stumble and fall a thousand times on the way, but they will, they will be there. And that's that's a doctrine that I was I was reading in the, some some history books on this. And King James, who authorized the translation of the the Bible, was very disturbed because the Arminians of his day had sent text over to the archbishop to review. And the text were the usual Arminian stuff, but he was so infuriated, particularly by the fact that salvation wasn't certain. Salvation was only good as long as you were good. And it, it so offended him, he had all the books <laughs> piled up and burned. And uh, it was a good thing for that man that he didn't live in the United Kingdom at that time. It would have been, he would have been on the fire pile. But... Uh, and so salvation is not conditioned upon continued obedience. How else could the saints rejoice? Turn to Philippians chapter 1. You know, I, over the years, you have to be an old guy to see this. You have to be an old guy to see this. But you see people that, quote, get saved under the false, false gospels of our day. And you see them as young, they're, they're enthusiastic, they're inspired, they're, they're all gung-ho about this. They're sharing with everybody on the street corners, and they're doing these things, and they're all religious. Hang around for a while, and you'll see all that go away. You'll see all that, that blow away, and uh, um, and truth be told, they would need to fear. <laughs> they would need to fear, because they, they you know, the... They, they're no longer revved up. They're no longer uh, excited. And if God were, if their salvation was based on what they do and their salvation was based on them continuing doing it, they're not doing it anymore. They're not doing what they initially did. But look at Philippians 1, 6. Paul said, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you, repentance, a new heart, faith to believe, that's the good work. He that has began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. 
And that's an exciting thing. You know, it doesn't, it's not conditioned. It's your continuing on is this, the same grace of God that causes you to see the truth of his word and see the truth of his son. Turn to, to uh, John chapter 6. We've got a couple of verses in John 6 and, and chapter 10. It's an ecstatically wonderful thing to know that when David was in the depths of sin with Bathsheba, and that was an ugly, ugly thing, that God still had an immeasurable love for that sinner and was determined and would save him eternally. In John chapter 6, and verse 37, Jesus says, All the Father that gives me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. This is the security of the believer. This is the security that David knew. This is the security that Moses knew. Turn to John chapter 10. This gives the believer great confidence that when they fall, if not falling to their eternal doom, that God, will, by the grace of God, he'll be, they'll be picked up yet again. In John 10, in verse 28, Jesus said, I, and I give them eternal, eternal life, not conditional life, eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The world believes you can pluck yourself out of that hand. Jesus says, Isn't, aren't you any man? That's what Pastor Warner used to say. I like that. So, in, and in Jude one twenty four, you don't need to turn there, but, but uh, Paul said, Now unto him that's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. In fact, let's turn there because there's, there's some other stuff I want to read in that passage. In Jude, uh, it's the only one chapter right before Revelation. Now unto him that's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Boy, just uh, uh, those drawn by God to repent of their hope in themselves, their self-righteousness, their arrogance about this thing, their notion that they control God, and by the grace of God, uh, look to the look to Christ as all all their need to meet all of their need. Washed in that, washed in the blood, as was mentioned this morning. Uh, his blood being sufficient for every deficiency they have, and they have a limitless list. And that, that that washing away of that sin is all that the sinner needs. And having that to be their hope, that's, that's comfort. So the sixth, fifth point I want to make, these are shorter points. That which is lost still belongs to God. There's nothing, that, that, that sheep, you know, which reflects the election of God. When it was a lost sheep. It was a lot, the, the coin that was lost by the woman it wasn't any less her coin, just because it wasn't where in any place that you know that was right in front of the person. So that which belongs to God is always God's, and that's a, the eternal election and love of God for His people. Point six: Unlike us, God never loses that which is lost. He'll diligently seek and find all that's lost. No one's, nothing in the end will be lost that shouldn't be found. Uh, God, God will recover each and every soul that he has determined from before time will be drawn unto his son. And then point number seven, that this salvation is very personal. It says there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner. They're going to have a hoot and a howl over one. Just one. Just one person. No, no matter how humble that person is, no matter how great that person is in this world, doesn't matter. God's, the angels of heaven are going to rejoice over that one sinner. 
And that's that's a crazy exciting thought. So in conclusion, then, there is a command of God and a need of repentance or a turning of one's mind about Christ, about God, about hope for man. That's point number one. Repentance requires that we cease from our works, our deeds, our choices, our actions to please God and submit to Christ's work as all that's required. Submitting to that choice, good works will follow. It says we're saved unto good works. That's a natural thing. This runs counter to our nature, which would have us men, men to rule over God, which would have us to have a, a God who uh, can't save, a God who uh, has is not omnipotent, does not get his way in heaven and earth, uh, but rather a God that's really, you know, the world's God is really themselves, the more you strip it down. Faith to believe, point number three, faith to believe and the desire to turn from our own hope emanates from a new heart given by God for reasons only he knows. And I can say it's certainly not because of the sinner's qualities. Not in my case and not, not in yours. God it says who he will for reasons that we'll, we'll never understand. All we'll be is amazed by it because it doesn't make sense to us. There's so many more worthy people if we're going to go by human attributes. But it pleases God to, to save those whom he will. And uh, we just we just praise and thank him for it. And the very angels of heaven rejoice when one sinner repents, as I just mentioned. And finally, uh, those saved by the grace of God in Christ, those whose hearts are new about this and see that work as com their complete need, uh, meeting their complete need, those saved by grace can't go back to their former trust. They identify their former trust. The sheep follow him all their days. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. That's what they do. What else could they do? They heard the shepherd. Nowhere else to go. Like, like Peter said, to whom else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. They follow. Though full of failure, they continue to hold their hope in Christ's work alone, on the work of the cross, because that they know meets every need and addresses every failure. And in fact, they know also that when they get to heaven, it's all forgotten. It doesn't even, it's as if nothing ever, uh, as if nothing ever happened. All those faults that we are so aware of and all of our failures we're so sensitive about, they don't even register in God's mind because they've all been washed away in the blood of Christ. For this, God will be inquired of. And here's your comfort. He does this oftentimes with men. Men and women, people, the generic men. So I, I praise him that he saves, and I pray that you find your hope in him.